Like any other uh, farm, whether you're using conventional inputs or you're buying your, your fertilizer via manure, um, there's a cost associated with growing a crop. And when you look at what your uh, cost is going to be on an acre, you, what you want to make sure is you have a realistic fertilizer rate. It doesn't matter if it's conventional or organic, that matches to the actual crop productivity of a piece of ground. So for example, on our farm here, where we farm dry land, where at most, if I get decent rain through the year, I'm going to get 135, 140 bushel. Uh, you know, on average, we're going to shoot for more of a 120 bushel bushel an acre crop of corn, for example, on my fertilizer plan. Just fertilizer is not the limiting factor on an annual basis, it's water. And since we don't have irrigation there, I'm going to see probably there, there's no economic advantage to putting more nutrients out there for a crop that isn't going to be there due to lack of water. Vice versa, now where we have irrigation and we can push 200 bushel corn, I will fertilize for a 200 bushel corn crop. I have water now and I've eliminated that as a factor. I just need decent sunlight and if I provide the fertility, God provides the yield. So my philosophy on your farm when, when individual producers hire me is what resources do we have on your farm that I can tap into, whether it be native fertility due to your parent material of your soils uh, and more natural fertility levels, or what are the weak points as far as I need, I'm going to need to supplement it with some off the farm inputs. I think there's a misconception that when we talk about precision agriculture, we're strictly talking about RTK. And for example, we used to have a New Holland 195 horizontal beater, and the evenness of the manure going across the field was relatively variable. And so when we looked at the corn crop like we were at before, you would see that variability in the crop due to the spread pattern. We were frustrated with that, and so as a management decision, we bought a vertical beater spreader so we could have a more even uniform rate going across the field. So it wasn't just tons applied to the field, but they were uniformly applied to the field so the entire crop has good nutrients and a good nutrient base. Um, there are dry fertilizers we can use, and we do use a number of them. Uh, potassium sulfate, for example. Uh, we use um, uh, gypsum, pelletized gypsum, boron, trace minerals, you know, di dictated by what the soil test requires. And so individual fields get their own fertilizer plan at the beginning of the year. We look at what that cost is going to be. I look at the estimated return on investment. And then we make the decision what rate we want to go with. What's a realistic crop goal? And can we afford it? And what nutrients are going to cover or give me my biggest bang for my buck? So one of the key ones as a crop consultant, you need to be aware if you're working with an organic producer, while we do use a lot of manure, not all manure is certifiable doesn't necessarily have to come off of an organic operation, but you need to make sure that there are no additives to the manure and that the bedding is, is an approved um, bedding source as well. It's not, uh, for example, if it's shavings, it's from a natural shaving source. It's not from processed wood like pallets ground up and things of that nature or from a wood shop. The other um, NLP standard that you need to be or so maybe not as readily known as, for example, if you're using uh, chicken litter pellets, for example, on food crops. There is a time restriction as far as based upon whether or not that pellet was heat treated and passes the NLP standards as a composted product, or if it's a facil facility that doesn't, uh, you need to make sure that that is applicable or you're, you have the um, necessary time period uh, between application date and when that crop is going to be harvested. Otherwise, you could cause issues uh, from a edible standpoint going for food. Uh, testing manure, um, for example, um, let's say we we're going to spread beef manure on 50 acres. Um, you know, it, manure tests can range anywhere from $35 to $60 an acre. So to pull a manure sample on what I'm going to spread on that field is going to cost me, let's say, roughly a dollar an acre. Now, mismanage of that manure can cost me 20, 30, 40 bushels of, of corn an acre. So again, it goes to the ROI. What's the ROI of that manure test? Well, it could be a dollar spent to get 100, 200, 300 dollars in return to make sure I put the, the necessary nutrients out there for a good crop. And I didn't waste the manure. I didn't over apply and waste money putting excess nutrients and cause environmental harm over the long term. Pretty much gonna spread tire to tire on a horizontal beater. 
and your challenge is how even it's coming out the back of the spreader. Versus vertical beaters are designed to rip apart the material as it gets pushed towards the rear of the spreader and sling it out so it's scattered evenly across the ground. When we have an even application of this, you look across the field, you see no variability on that manure before we work it in. And that's a key, one of the key decisions we made to getting a vertical beater spreader versus a horizontal beater spreader. Let's say I was looking at a small grain crop, right? So here I have excess, I, behind the spreader where I'm putting it thick on a horizontal beater, I've got excess manure that's applied, and now I have a strip in between where it's, it, it's shorted. So here the crop has excess nitrogen that it can't use. It has an over application of manure. And here I'm going to have yield loss because it's shorted. It doesn't have enough manure to finish the crop. So I might combine 40 bushel wheat here and this might be 65 and the excess nitrogen just went into the groundwater and there was no point of putting. So it's looking interfield then as far as evenness of spread and making sure that I have an even nutrient application going across the entire field. Otherwise, you can have, as far as spots in the field or, or rows in the field, uh, areas in the field that are over-applied and under-applied. You know, you may have, and your total tons per acre or total tons per field might be correct, but my total tons per square foot might be incorrect based upon the variability of that spreader. So the first thing we do when we get a farm is, and in, in, when I deal with a producer that picks up a new field, is we pull soil test. Now, on a field like this, relatively uniform, I ended up taking two different samples. The east side of this field, about 20 acres, is much sandier than as you move down the hill here some. So I, some cases will zone sample it based upon topography or soil types. Uh, if I get yield maps, we can sometimes split it up and do uh, zone sampling. Um, if, if there's a lot of variability on the field or on the farm, we'll look to grid sample. But for the most part, I would say I strict stick with mostly zone sampling, picking up a new piece. So once we got the samples back, I can look at, okay, what's my fertility profile? What nutrients do I need to address for the crop that I want to grow? If there's good fertility there, especially during the transitional years, you have an opportunity maybe to tap into that bank a little bit and draw down on some of those nutrients and then build them back up once you're organic and you're cash flowing better. In this particular field in the transition years, we couldn't do that because the initial fertility levels were very, very low. So we needed to put a higher, higher nutrient rate, both with dry fertilizer and manure here through the transition year and now here on the first year of its organic production in order to keep it up. And that was part of the transition expense then. That had to be accounted for to make it through those transition years. Um, so this year we've got kidneys. Um, I've got turkey manure out here, beef manure. Again, the beef manure provides a good, good source of potassium here on our light soils. Um, the other thing beef manure does for our edible beans when it comes to right rate, right timing, when we talk about right timing, beef manure is a slower release product. And especially for beans, I don't want a lot of early season nitrogen to push weeds and promote more weed growth. I want more late season nitrogen when this is packing and looking to fill the pods versus early season nitrogen. Still need some early season nitrogen, but it's a balancing act of how much do I want early and how much do I want to see later on. Uh, and then the dry fertilizer blend that we looked on this field was more dressing trace minerals, particularly boron, sulfur, uh, as both of those on the soil test were extremely low. So nitrogen on corn um, in following good nutrient management principles, um, it comes to accrediting for nitrogen from manure nitrogen from legumes, and that doesn't matter if you're in a conventional uh, corn system or if you're in an organic corn system. Uh, the key there is um, that you adequately credit for them and account for the, new, the nitrogen that comes from that, um, that nitrogen source. So <clears throat> uh, organic growers that are struggling with nitrogen normally have several weak points, I find, on average. Uh, one, we're not doing adequate manure testing, so we don't actually know what we put out in the field. And then when the crop goes yellow and runs short, well, I put five ton of manure on there. Well, was it five ton at a 30 pound value, or was that five ton at 70 pound value? Because in one case, we're gonna be short, uh, you know, probably a good 40 to 60 pounds a N, and in another case, they probably have an over, uh, over application of close to 80 pounds a N. Um, 
And then the other thing is when we look at ligand crediting, uh, it's important to look at university data and the nutrient bulletins that we have with all the land grant universities and use those uh, appropriately uh, to credit the, the, give the proper nitrogen credit to the previous crop. So soybean credit, you know, typically that 40 to 50 pounds depending on the university. Alfalfa, there's wide variation depending on how good the stand was, what your soil type is, if it's a first year terminated alfalfa or if it's a multi-year stand. Um, and, and that's where a little bit of the art comes in the science is to be able to go and make an adequate assessment of that legume crop and keep track of that of how much, what can I count on for a nitrogen credit from this previous crop going to this corn crop. When it comes to getting away from urea, 28% and hydrous, uh, I know there's somewhat of a mentality that we can't grow a crop, an adequate corn crop, and that's not at all true. This is 100% legume and manure credits. Last year our corn had 100% manure and legume credits and we were able to knock on 200 bushel organic corn. There's no reason why we can't, if we adequately account for the legume and the manure credits, that we can't adequately get uh, very good yields at the end of the year with adequate amount of nitrogen without it being an over application as well. Um, the other issue that I see with growers that ask that question is they're coming in with a conventional mentality, I want to grow corn every year or I'm going to grow corn with a filler crop every other year. And while you can certainly do that and with high rates of manure certainly do that, one of the issues I've seen over the long term is that within five, six, seven years, you've now built up to have excessive, excessive phosphorus levels. So one of the reasons why we run a diversified crop rotation is yes, on corn years, I may be applying excessive phosphorus for that specific year, but then I'm using a, then I'm using a bean crop maybe the next year to draw some of that phosphorus out or I'm using an alfalfa crop to draw down that phosphorus that I built up from maybe a previous back-to-back -back corn year, for example. Um, so you can use your crop rotation to manage not just building your soil up, but also making sure you don't get excessive nutrients, uh, particularly phosphorus when it comes to manure management. So if you haven't caught early on a nitrogen shortage and you're looking for a rescue treatment in organic production, Given that most of our end sources are biologically released, they take a certain amount of time to release. So if your crop is past, let's say V6, V7, all of a sudden you're starting to see serious yellowing out there, um, that has to be addressed next year in the spring prior to planting. Uh, there are a few rescue options. Some producers will look maybe for a product called chili nitrate, uh, for example, uh, and they've kind of loosened up the restrictions on that product. However, I would point out at the cost of three plus dollars per pound of nitrogen, it's very cost prohibitive and given it's a high salt product, it's not very conducive for root growth. Um, so are there a few things that you can use to tweak the crop maybe at that stage perhaps, but organic is really one of the key things about proper nutrient management is before the season even starts, make sure that you've accounted and credited and done everything you possibly could to make sure at least, you know, you've ran your manure test, you've ran your soil test, um, you know, the, you're working with somebody that knows your area, what, what your decent, what respectable crop yields are, realistic crop yields are, and that they're putting a nutrient plan adequate to the crop that you're trying to grow. So one of the things I deal with when I, especially when I have a transitioning producer from conventional to organic, is in the conventional world we're used to essentially I need something, I run to the store, buy it, and put it on. You go to your co-op, you say, I need another application of herbicide, the weeds aren't dead. Or I need another jag of nitrogen, so I'm gonna put on another 10, 20 gallons of 28%. Organically, we don't have that. Uh, our tools in the toolbox are good tools, but they're long-term tools. So you need, it really emphasizes then good planning. You can't last minute save the crop. Um, you have to make sure that you're addressing, again, those nutrient concerns up front, beginning of the season, so that it's provided there all through the season. And that would be uh, maybe the type of manure I'm using, um, especially if on sand ground. For example, this is sweet corn, so it's planted in June. And uh, given this is lighter soil, we make the management decision not to apply our nitrogen or manure on the fall before, we wait to the spring before the sweet corn to make sure that I reduce the amount of time I might have leaching 
out of that manure going into the groundwater. Uh, whether you're, you're working on the conventional side or organic side is when it comes to man managing nutrients, unlike weeds, we already have very similar tools and, and uh, products when it comes to manure. We deal with that on the conventional side on a regular basis. It's just applying the good nutrient management principles and manure management practices that we already know and should be applying on the conventional side. Maybe we get too lax on the conventional side because we do have the band-aids we can throw at the crop. I can go get 100 pounds of urea if I mismanage my manure or don't get it worked in at an adequate time. Um, so organic, it's very important that Basically, you follow the, the, the good nutrient management principles that are out there. And that's the nice thing is that you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not having to learn an entirely new system. They're all things we should be doing as good crop advisors and good agronomists.